Good morning, everyone. Well, let's start it again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Goodness, okay. It's great to have you with us today. Um, welcome to the Living Room Church this morning. My name is Andrew. I'm the pastor here. If you are visiting with us, maybe for the first time, then a really special welcome to you. I hope you feel that you are at home with us in the living room um, church that we are. Um, it's a lovely morning. I think the weather might be getting a bit worse as the day goes on. But uh, just a reminder, don't rush off after the service. We do have teas and coffees over in our other building. Um, and so you're really welcome to join us over there. Well, what kind of a week have you had? I wonder if you had a busy week, a full week, uh, a nasty week. We're going to be finding out what's been happening just over this last week uh, with the Northern Irish team who've been visiting. We're going to find out also today in our service just about living room kids who went on a camp with Word of Life this summer and find out what they learned. And we're going to take some time to listen to God's Word preached. And so we're looking forward to John coming today to share from the book of Matthew and we're also going to have our own time to sing some praises um, to God. So I really pray that the next hour is going to be one that you're going to be invigorated and encouraged and refreshed and blessed. So just by way of announcements as well, um, remembering that our baptisms are this week, uh, this, this evening at 6 p.m. Come rain or shine, we will be there. Um, at Port Seaton at the boat shore just behind Cockenzie House. Uh, there's, no, um, there's no car parking, it's only on street parking there. So please leave yourself time to get there um, and get parked. Because the weather is looking iffy for tonight, if we could just say, we want to get started at six. We don't want to be hanging around for 20 minutes and wait, waiting for people, more people to arrive. Okay, so do your best please to get there so that we can start on six, at, at six o'clock. Um, also, just a little announcement, we have a team, not this week, but the following, arriving at the weekend, and they are, they have some, some really uh, special um, gifting, and we have somebody who helps with music and leads with the music at a church called West Cabarrus Church in North Carolina, they're coming at the weekend, and they have loads of different experience with music and what we'd love to do is put together some events that people can come and join in. Um, they can come and learn more about doing music in church and enjoy doing music. So we're going to have, we'll put this out in an email as well, but just three evenings to be able to get together and be able to develop music, to put together a band because, on our next slide, on Friday the 6th of September, we have been graciously allowed to use St. Clement's Church across the road, and we want to have a tri-church event where we can really invite people to come along to experience church, obviously with a music team that's been rehearsing that week. The music should be extra special, just like our music this morning is going to be extra special with the team that's been put together for that. And it's just an opportunity for us to just invite, come and try church, Come and experience what church can be like. We know that we have something incredible. We have a treasure in our jars of clay. And we long that people would know Jesus for themselves. So this will be an outreach event that you can invite people along. So we'll send all of that out in the usual means, email and, and WhatsApp as well. I just want to read from Psalm 146. It says this, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith 
forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. I'm going to invite our music team to come ahead on up. And just as the music starts, let's stand and let's just enjoy a song that I sent out on the WhatsApp this morning. Hopefully you got. time and so Chris and Hannah um, just if you could come ahead and share with us hello everyone um, if you can tell I'm Hannah and he's Chris um, yeah we've had an amazing week uh, as you, some of you may know Auntie Carl or Carl is my aunt and Rebecca over here as well and um, we have Daniel here and uh, Taylor who was here but had to leave early unfortunately because he was playing at a wedding um, what a blessing so um, we've had a great time and we just want to take this time to kind of re report on the week that we've had to, to fill you in because we knew that so many of you have been praying for us and we thank you for that and um, we've definitely the, the energy has been low but somehow we've made it to the end of the week and we knew that's because of your prayer um, and your thoughts for us so thank you so yeah just a few minutes 
Yeah, so there is our, our team up on the board. I'm actually not sure what order any of these pictures may come up, but one of the main things that we were involved with during the week was in Wallyford Primary. And so with the, the connection into the school, with their principal and their VPs, we're well on board. Uh, to be able to come in and help with the P6 and the P7 classes with their PE lessons, uh, which would then sort of feed into the lunch times that we would help out with every day in the school. So we were there working alongside the kids, trying to teach them new games to play in the primary school uh, so that they could then teach the younger kids, make sure that everyone is maybe involved. And I think it, it was nothing that was explicitly gospel, nothing explicitly telling people about Jesus, but hopefully um, it really does pave a way for future work into the school. Um, I guess the, the little photo in the library was maybe a bit of evidence of, of hopeful uh, hope for the future and a bit of prayer to go further on the the way that you guys have been able to bless the library in the school we had hoped for a session on a thursday afternoon to teach them about creation but just a bit of miscommunication between the, the staff and the pupils and the kids and the parents it just meant that it wasn't quite what we expected but there's definitely uh hope as i said for the future to get back in and, and make use of the of the library and the space in the school so one of the other big things, is it going to come up next, it may be the pawn work, yeah, so we've been over, yeah, helping out with a, a bit of a project, maybe it's not too well known around the church, but um, out at Roost Place there's this uh, terrific pond. it was a bit overgrown, uh, Hannah and Rebecca's dad is, is, a, is a pond fanatic, uh, a fish fanatic too, so he was able to help give us a bit of guidance on what we would do, so in order just to, to clear out that pond, uh, empty it of all the water, uh, fill it back up again, having removed all the old plants and put a new liner in on top of it. It was hard work, uh, sweaty work, very mucky work too, but um, we're really grateful that we could do something very practical, I suppose. Uh, hopefully it goes on to bless people that really need it uh, in the future. Yeah, and then I suppose uh, the main thing that we had kind of our focus on was the blaze groups, um, which by the way, you guys who go to blaze and ignite, you guys are really, really lucky. The group that you have there is really, really special. And I think uh, last night we were reflecting on our highs and our lows and our buffaloes. Um, and I think my one of my highs was just the encouragement of you guys, the young folk who are so excited and keen to just like chat to you and just to share about God and to share about what's happening in their lives and the, the friendships and the bond that you guys have is really special and I encourage you to keep inviting your friends because you've got something special here um, which is just amazing. So yeah we've had um, we had three, four nights of blaze um, some of them were a little bit more relaxed than others um, and as you can see we've done loads of different things. We had a pizza night in the last night we uh, climbed Arthur's Hill um, some of the, oh, Arthur's seat, sorry. It felt like it, it was definitely a hill. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of carpet ball. Um, we've seen the guy, well, Daniel and uh, Taylor were definitely, I think we're bringing back pick, uh, carpet ball to Northern Ireland for sure. Um, very fun game. And loads of different little challenges and stuff. But it was great to, um, it was great to meet you guys and to get to know you. And hopefully it'll not be the last time we see you all. Um, and then, uh, we also had a chance to get involved with Mums and Tots, which we were told um, is a really crucial part of, of the work that you do here, the connections that you build from Mums and Tots. A lot of the times that we were at the school, we'd be like, oh, where's Carl gone? And she was away talking to one of the mums that she'd met at Mums and Tots. And it's it's really special to see how you know that connection doesn't, it's not lost. They still remember your faces and they still remember the people who cared for them and um, when maybe they were needing that little bit of extra support as a, as a mum. Um, we know it's, it's no easy job. Um, and yeah, it's just such a, a key ministry. So keep continuing to pray for that. Um, as you can see, we were organising all of the toys. Um, some of us were kind of getting distracted and playing with the toys. Daniel. Uh, <laughs> but it was good fun. Um, but yeah, as we kind of reflect on the whole week, we just want to say a big thank you um, because we know that none of this could have been done with, with some very important people which we want to shout out to. So we were fed. Um, very important, there's a lot of us and we, we ate well this week, we ate very well, we don't want to leave now, but we want to thank um, Sharon, Caroline, Claire, Lizzie and Leanne, Gordon and Miriam, Ruth, David and uh, of course the Agnews for, for feeding us and if I've forgotten anyone I'm so sorry. Um, and then also those who shared in their ministry, we got a chance to, to hear a bit more about some people who have some really special things going on um, in their lives, uh, the work that they're doing for the Lord. So we heard from Lena, we heard from David and we heard from Ruth. Um, and we also want to give a big shout out to Anna, 
who helped us with the school. You've been such a great support. I don't know what she's at the back. Um, you've been such a great support to us all, and I think we just we've made a friend in you. Um, uh, and you just you've got such an uplifting and, and bubbly personality. It's it's just hard to not smile when you're around. And um, so thank you so much for all the support you you've given to us. Um, and I think I think that's all for us. Just, um, just to say, <laughs> Hannah and Daniel, they're heading into their last years of their degrees that they're studying, and um, Rebecca, she's going into another year of work. Chris, you're coming to the end of an employment, and uh, what's next for you? Yeah, so my, my context back home is a, a church up around the north coast of Northern Ireland. Uh, it's called Balamani. It's a bit of a commuter town. People generally drive around the ring road to get to the nice places, I suppose, up on the coast. And yeah, it's sort of my first real job since leaving university and I know the Lord had always laid a, a strong passion for, for youth ministry in the church I grew up in around Belfast. It was parked probably at uni and sort of thinking, will I go for this, will I not? Uh, but I think off the back of the pandemic there was opportunities to, I guess, get involved with youth ministry and it's been a really, it has been a really enjoyable three years. Um, the church in Northern Ireland sort of alongside that maybe the church that I've experienced or heard about in Scotland, they obviously are quite different, but it doesn't mean that in any way one is better than the other. You know, our, our church back home, one of the things I've been learning or it's been so challenged by this this week, especially from the young people themselves, is that you're all here, the young people especially, and for you guys too, you're all here because you really want to be here. Okay, it's not that it's a comfortable thing, it's not that it's an easy thing to come along to your church youth group like it maybe is. In Northern Ireland where blessings upon blessings it's generations of family have been coming to the church in the town but to then go out into school and to really put your flag in the ground and say I, I believe this I live by this I'm prepared to be unpopular I'm prepared to be an outcast stick out a little bit uh, it's just it's, it's really interesting how we think about very or getting the thing the two so we've married up together. And so yeah, the, the opportunity to come out here is, is always really exciting to see ministry in a different context. And uh, for the, the short bit of time that I've, I've still got left with my uh, contract in Balamoney, uh, it'll be interesting to sort of share that on and, and feed that back. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess these next number of months will be an interesting one to see where the Lord leads. It's uh, currently uh, have an interest to still w remain within youth ministry. There's, uh, yeah, I go back tomorrow and, and have a bit of a follow-up uh, chat um, for a role with an organisation which may or may not be the, be the best thing for me, uh, but I think it's the right thing to, to go forward in. But uh, I, I guess there's, there's always encouragement for no matter, no matter who you are, if it's a confusing part of your life right now or even as a, as a church family, you're thinking about how do we, do we want to move forward? We, you have the plans to, to move to move into the other site and, and everything else, but it's just knowing well what is the, the timing of it all and how yeah what the steps themselves look like because sometimes they they may be clouded, but as long as I guess the steps keep happening, that's the, the key thing. Well, listen, let's really pray. Let's pray for the work that the team's done um, before the kids leave. Let's just really pray for what it's been to be able to work alongside them and also just for these guys as they head back. We're so grateful for them. Lord, thank you so much for just the joy of what it is to work with people from all over the world and to, to be able to reach people in this community, to spread the name of Jesus a little bit more in this community this week. We want to thank you for the work that the team have done. We want to pray for them as they head back into uh, different circumstances, some study, some work. But we want to pray for Chris as well, that you will lead him, Lord, that you will guide, that you will open up the right doors for him and for ministry for the future as well. Lord, we want to thank you so much for what you have done um, in and through them this week. And we pray that you will bless them, encourage them, and fire them up for their next steps in ministry as well. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we are going to split up now, so if you are preschool, you're going out this door into Sparks, and if you are primary school, you're heading out that door to Ignite, and if you're left behind, turn around to welcome somebody to church today. <laughs> I'm 
Well, much as I hate to break into folks' conversations, or uh, by the way, just in case you were wondering, you are in Scotland today. Don't worry. <laughs> Northern Irish accent. Um, something else um, just was wonderful that happened during the summer. Um, just thanks to amazing donations and help um, from supporters of Word of Life. Um, actually, some of our kids were able to uh, travel over to Spain for a Word of Life camp. And so I'm just going to get the guys, come over, come on, don't be hanging out over there. We've got a microphone here. And it's really, um, Jacob, if I can ask you first. <laughs> Jacob, going over to Spain can't have been easy and everybody's speaking in Spanish and getting translation and some people speaking some English. But obviously, it was a really great experience. Yeah. And God taught you some, some things while you were there. Just what, what kind of things did God teach you while you were there? Um, one thing I have learned whilst I was away is obviously trying to find God's voice within me. Because everyone else is like dancing around, they have so much passion and stuff for God. And I was like, why do I not have that? Why does everyone else have that? Why do I not have that? So I've been constantly praying over the week while I was there. How can I ha can I have your voice in my heart? Yeah. And one of the guys, uh, he was a missionary from America that came over to Spain, and he was talking about how he found God in his heart. And he prayed over me, and that night I found that joy in my heart. I ended up, you know, praising God so much more within the worship, even though it was in Spanish. So that was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Oscar. Oscar, can you jump up to the microphone? Oscar, yes. So struggling with struggling with the language and trying to um, trying to understand what was going on, and obviously everything being. But what did God teach you during that week as well? Well, I mean, one of the main points they were given was like not living in the world, and it was more recharging our faith. <laughs> And so one thing for me was, there was a part where we were learning about the woman in the well and how as soon as she heard about um, Jesus, then she just told, she dropped everything she had and she just went and told everyone she could immediately. And I think that really stood out to me how I'm, I shouldn't be hiding what I found, the love I found from Jesus and that I should be telling as many people as I can, as soon as I can. Okay, Tabitha, what about you? Maybe a little bit more Spanish in the week, but um, how did you find that week and what did God teach you while you were there? Well, just during the week, obviously we went there and it was really difficult not being able to speak Spanish. But just seeing that we're all there for the same reason, we're all just the same as here, we're all here because we love Jesus so, so much. And the whole week, um, I mean, it was especially the... Um, the parable of uh, the, the Samaritan um, definitely was just the, the one thing that stood out for me that week was just how I should show everybody the same love. And it doesn't matter, like, you know, if, if you're this or if you're that. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I can't, you know, I need to just love everyone the same, just as God loves us all the same. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what I learned, really. <laughs> But, Tabitha, that's not all, because 
at going to Spain this summer was it put a real fire in you to learn more Spanish, didn't it? Yeah, well, um, I'm just going to expose myself. I had to do research for Spanish uh, for university, which was a little bit humbling, um, but no, it was okay. So just after I came out of the exam, I realised, like, I learned so much in Spain, and not only just did I learn from the Word of God, but I also learned so much Spanish. Um, so I was like, do you know what? For two years now, I've been hearing about this Word of Life Institute in Argentina. Why don't I just go for it? So I spoke to mum and dad and I was, <laughs> thank you Alison. <laughs> I spoke to mum and dad and I said, you know what, I think I'm just ready to do it. And um, I'm, I've started the process and to be honest guys, I just really need your prayer. There's a lot to do still, uh, not just packing all my outfits, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of legal work to do and I need loads of prayer for it. Um, but I'm just so excited to see how God's gonna use me. I just, not because I know that Spanish is my calling, I know for a fact, um, and I'm just, I really hope that I do go to Argentina, because. Wow. <laughs> well, obviously, um, I had the privilege of being able to go out last year to go and see um, a, a bilingual program, a, a bilin bilingual Bible program that they have out in Argentina, and I couldn't be more um, secure that she's going to an amazing place, but so she could be away within four weeks, and I've already had a cry about it, but um, I just know that God's got amazing things for just these great, great kids that we have, and you know, it's not just them, I mean, there are other ones who did other brilliant things during the summer and have been away doing brilliant camps and things, so uh, let's just pray for our youth, shall we, and just as we um, get ready to continue with our service. Lord. Thank you that you are always teaching, you're always moving, and Lord, you're guiding and leading. Thank you so much for what you've done in the lives of our kids. Thank you for what they have been part of in Blaze. Thank you that it is growing and it is um, inviting more folks in. Lord, thank you for just the joy of what it is uh, to input into the lives of, of the next generation. Lord, we are such a, a blessed church family to have so many young folks uh, with us. And we want to pray that you will continue to lead and guide. We pray for next steps for those making big decisions, those who are filling out forms for college, for university this year as well. Lord, would you bless, would you guide um, so that they would be in your will and Lord, growing in you. We pray these things for your glory. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, guys. We're going to invite our music team back up and we can sing a song about how much we do need God. So just when the music um, gets going, please um, feel free to stand and sing. Yeah, we'll put our music in the right order this time.
that we never get tired of hearing about what God's done in his life. You know, um, if I say that, like, it's boring, and it certainly isn't. Class, we love you. And Class is just going to share just that little bit with us about um, him becoming a Christian and a bit more of his testimony. Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things just this morning, because I know not everyone's going to be at the baptism. You're all my church family, so it's important to share things with everyone, even those who aren't going to be there. Um, my wife tells me that I talk quite a lot and I can ramble quite a bit. <laughs> Don't know where she gets that from at all. Um, so I've written down a couple of thoughts this morning, um, just to stay a bit succinct, um, and that we don't run over time too much. Um, as you'll know from when I've done my testimonies, uh, testimonies in the past, sometimes I can shed a tear. I'll try to keep it dry, I can't guarantee anything. The hardest thing is going to be reading my own handwriting. I'm a doctor, and yeah. my handwriting is so bad I can't even read myself. So, um, for those of you who know me, you know I come from a secular background, maybe slightly nominal Christian background, uh, but not knowing Jesus as I was growing up at all. About nine years ago, I came to learn that the God of the universe loved me so much that he was willing to die for me on a cross, um, to take the punishment for my sins. Um, I had no problem accepting I was a sinner, um, but I had no idea that there was, a, that there was one true God, um, and that he cared for me so much to provide salvation. From my own sin by grace through faith. Um, as John 8.32 says, the truth will set you free. It did, and it has. Um, I came to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I have become a different person. Um, as Colossians 3 says, I put off my old self, and I put on the new self. I took up my cross and decided to follow Jesus. Um, that's been very hard at times, um, but it's also brought immense joy. The God of the universe loves us more than we can even imagine, but he also demands our obedience and our pursuit of holiness. Ever since I became a believer, the Holy Spirit that I have been indwelt with um, has continued to convict me to be baptized as a believer. Therefore, I have decided to be baptized as a believer as a sign of my belief in the one true God and my acceptance of the gift of salvation my submission to his authority, and my appreciation of his incomparable love. Um, as it says in Colossians 2, so I could be buried with him in baptism and raised with him through faith. That's pretty sure. John, John, thank you so much, class. John, would you come up and, and open up the word for us? Let's just pray for John as he comes. Lord, thank you so much for this church. We are so grateful that here we have people who love you. And I want to thank you for people who study your word to bring it to us so that we can feed from you. And I pray that you will use John to bless us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, we thought we would throw in yet another accent uh, this morning. <laughs> and, uh, and ironically, it's not a Scottish one <laughs> for our Scottish church. Um, 
Right, we're in chapter 11 of Matthew this morning, and because we've had a wee break over the summer, I'll give you a wee recap. All the way from chapter 1, it is a short recap, all the way from chapter 1 through to Matthew chapter 9, we've been, Matthew's been telling us of how Jesus had been fulfilling prophecy after prophecy that foretold the coming of the Savior. Prophecy that said God himself would come and bring an end to evil and then rule and reign as king over Israel and the rest of the world. Although, those, uh, although there's no mention of timings, by the way. And along with that, there was miracle after miracle. Jesus was healing everyone that came to him. Thousands upon thousands of people were being healed. In fact, we said that it would not be too far from the truth to say that almost all illness and disability would have been eradicated in that region during Jesus' time. And those miracles took place to confirm the authority of his teaching and confirm the identity of the Messiah. And all of those events and fulfillments, they all culminated at the end of chapter 9. You know, how are the people going to respond to all of that? What will the people say? Well, Matthew records what the Jewish leaders say in response to all of this. The representatives of Israel, they said in 934, and they declared it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Immediately after this shocking and evil response, Jesus then returns to his disciples and begins to train them in ministry, train them to become apostles. If you remember, the word apostle means one who is sent out. Now, unbeknown to them, Jesus is not only training them, but he's also giving us, the church, instructions on how to conduct ourselves and what response we can expect from the world as we hold out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, you'll remember, I hope, chapter 10. We had no fun whatsoever as we went through that horrific chapter. Is what Jesus told us what would happen about in, in that time that we're still in. Now in Matthew 11 today, verses 1 through 6, we're going to receive another response. The response of John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. We're going to see what his response was to everything that Jesus was doing, but not only that, everything Jesus was not doing. And that will make sense as we go along. So let's pray again. And we will read through and go through it bit by bit. Father, as we dive into your word, we are aware that it is only your Holy Spirit that can really make those scales fall off our eyes, as it were. So we are just praying and knowing that we are spiritually destitute. We pray that, Lord, you would give us ears to hear, a mouth to speak, and ears to hear. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. amen. Okay, verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. Now, there is a really interesting consideration in this verse. And it's this word, instructing. You see, the King James translates that word as commanding. And to be honest, I think within our culture anyway, that it's a far better word to use to translate that. Now, I know... If you've known me long enough that I tend to err on the side of pessimism. No, just, no. Sure. Oh, wow, that was a lot of confirmation there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be that obvious. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but anyway, my perspective may be slightly skewed here. <laughs> but I think when our culture sees the word instruction, I think we can almost look at that as optional. You know, we get, we get instructions with our IKEA furniture, and especially if you're a man, it's optional to use that. Um, but we get so many more instructions on how to park our car, where to park our car, um, how to pay our taxes, how to pray, how to read the Word. And, and if we're honest, as we look around, it, it, it certainly seems to be optional in the minds of many. That's why this word is so important. It means command. It does mean command. You see, chapter 10, as is the rest of the Bible, to Christians, it's not optional IKEA instructions. It is 
the commands of God on how to live that is in line with holiness and purity and love that God wants us to have. Now, just because we want to be careful here with legalism, we, need, we, we do understand that all of this is built on the precious gospel of Jesus Christ and offers salvation by sinner, for sinners by His blood and His sacrifice, not our own. And with all those come the commands um, and, and the promises, right? Now, the Beatitudes is a good example of this. Remember Makarios, or blessed, or supremely happy is the one who, well, for example, will say hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, supreme happiness is the reward for following that command. And as Christians, I really do think that we so often we need to take time to pause, to meditate, and think about that. That God's word is not an optional extra in our lives. If we have made him king over our lives as a result of understanding that gospel, we're going to try and obey. But not only that, we're not going to just try and obey. It's going to be a great joy to us to obey God. and something we pursue. There's many texts that would back that up. But Psalms 119, 15 and 16, the psalmist says, I will meditate on your precepts. I will fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. That shows you the, the heart there, behind that. So I guess the question is, is do, do you and I joyfully pursue holiness and understanding? And you can really tell. Just look back on the last seven days. And that will give you a good indication of what you think about that. Now, <clears throat> I am not arbitrarily just bringing this out of the passage. I think it's going to be very, very helpful as we begin to see how John the Baptist's response, how he responded to Jesus. And we'll do that now in, in, in verse 2. It says, When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, once again... <laughs> Another precious verse, at least from my perspective, and I'll explain that. You see, in, in verse 11, which we won't get to, Josh is going to be speaking to us about that next month. But it, Jesus says in verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there, is no, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Now that's an incredible compliment. Jesus is saying that until this particular moment in history, there has never been one human being that was more righteous than John the Baptist. Now, don't misunderstand that he was a sinner, just like the rest of us, but nevertheless, what a compliment. And it's so interesting that in this verse 2 here, that the most righteous man who had ever lived up until that point, anyway, he doubted. And he got confused. What is God doing here? Have I got things all wrong? And it's precious to me because if he did that, then I feel so much better about myself and all the doubts that I have on a regular basis. Now, for the sake of clarity, what do we mean by doubts? Because we all struggle with that from time to time. But please do not confuse doubt with unbelief. Sometimes I speak with folks and I think they believe doubt and unbelief are the same thing. They carry a huge amount of weight because of that. They can even question their salvation. But they're not the same. I see unbelief is when we know what God has said and we act contrary to that. That is the mark of an unbeliever. On the other hand, the commentaries that I was reading um, pointed out that almost all references to doubt were directed towards believers. Doubt, confusion, perplexity, all commonly expressed in the Psalms, for example, with phrases like, you know, why, O oh Lord? How long, O oh God? But there's no doubt. There's no doubt in God's headship. There is no arguments with His commands. And so... It is in this context that doubt can actually only happen in the life of a believer. As they look out at some of the most difficult situations 
and they have no idea what God is doing, and they feel discouraged and confused. Now, I also just want to say that um, I don't believe that God is happy with that. I'm not saying that that's, this is something that we should just be happy with. Um, because at the core of doubt, really, um, is the inability to be still and know that He is God. To be content with the Master's plan. But I really do believe from this passage that I, I believe that God understands this weakness. Um, how do I, how on earth can I have the authority to say something like that? Well, you're going to see how Jesus responds to John. And it's not going to be in the way that perhaps you may think. But I won't let the cat out of the bag, we'll get to that. So, in John's weakness, he doubts. Did I get things wrong? Have I misunderstood all the information that I was given as a prophet? Now, just, just to help you understand, remember the Gospel of John chapter 1. This is, this is his perspective, where he came from. I don't, I don't know if I have a slide. I do. Verse 32, it says, And John bore witness. He said, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen, and I have borne witness, that this is the Son of God. That's a very clear statement. But things have changed. Things have changed a lot since John chapter 1. At this stage, he's been put in prison for publicly confronting Herod with his uh, adulterous marriage to his brother's wife. In a commentary that I was reading suggested that perhaps 18 months has gone by that John has been stuck in an awful, hot, stifling prison. And this is where his doubt creeps in. So, let's spend a little bit of time here and consider three different reasons why he may have doubted. And I think that we're going to be able to find a lot of common, commonality here. The first one, perhaps, is um, difficult circumstances. So here's John, right? So far, having an incredible career as an unapologetic prophet for the Lord. I mean, this man is, is he's not interested in fine clothes or big houses. In Mark 1, we're told that he began preaching in the wilderness, not in the synagogues, in the fancy places, but in the wilderness. That um, Verse 6 says that John was clothed clothed with camel hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. I mean, that is so clear. He was not interested in materialism. With big cars and fancy houses, skinny jeans and whatever the latest makeup trend is. <coughs> He's just not interested. As a matter of fact, he was the epitome of the yet-to-be-written scripture when Paul said, for me to live is Christ. He was fearless, wholly aggressive, H-O-L-Y, wholly aggressive and faithful. But everything now seems to have ended in disaster and also relatively short-lived. Um, I was reading that he was imprisoned at an old fort called um, Macarius, if I'm pronouncing that right. But it was about 10 miles southeast of the Dead Sea. And in that area, it was probably nothing more than an incredibly stifling hot pit in the ground for 18 months. And so, the point that I'm making is that in his humanness, could it be that for all the work and all the commitment, the thoughts going through his head was, has everything I've done been for nothing? And is this the the outcome of all my sacrifice, all my commitment. And surely we are the same. Surely you can connect with that. And I know we ought, we know that we ought not to think like that, so maybe you don't say it out loud to people, but especially if a brother or sister in Christ has tried so hard to be faithful, tried so hard to live sacrificially for many years, and then tragedy comes, or loss comes. And doesn't the heart just want to scream, why me, oh God? It's not fair. 
A couple of years ago, Leslie and I were told by a supposed Christian woman, she said, I wish my husband had done something wrong that I could blame him, but he hasn't. I'm just done with this marriage and have to leave. And she, in her wake, she left a devastated Christian man who tried to live faithfully and be a good husband and father for many years. And you look at that and you go, why? That's not fair. I, um, I think I've told you this story before, but several years ago now, a relatively young man, relatively young man of God that I admired greatly, he died shortly after an operation. He left his wife and family behind. I think he had five kids, the youngest of which was in high school still. And what really poured salt into that wound was on the same day, a matter of fact, just a few hours later, Hugh Hefner died, the founder of Playboy magazine, at 92 years old. Why? Oh, God. That's not fair. And... Let me tell you how Satan loves to get behind those situations. If you know anything about rugby, they get that big scrum, that big guy in the middle, pushing those ideas. That's not fair. He loves to get behind those. Have you ever thought like that? Another reason we doubt. Second one. <clears throat> Partial understanding. In John's case, we know that he doesn't have all the facts. He was like any other prophet for that matter. We were given instructions from God, but none of them were given the full blueprint. In fact, now I find this a really cool verse, 1 Peter 1.10. Do I have a slide for that? I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. It says this. It says, concerning this salvation, this gospel, this coming of Jesus Christ, who spoke, uh, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. I think that's really cool because, in other words, the prophets themselves were studying their own writings to try and find out more information about the coming of the Messiah because they knew that their writings were inspired by God. See, John was no different to that. He waited to see the one on whom the Spirit of God descends, and now in a dark, dingy, humid dungeon, he's going, man, did I get this all wrong? And remember, he also only got most of this secondhand, uh, through secondhand information. Apart from the baptism, he does not work alongside Jesus. Once again, are we not the same? We doubt because of a lack of information, a lack of knowledge. We don't know how God is going to work in our lives, what doors He's going to open, what doors He's going to close that we really, really want to open. What storm is He going to let us go through? You know, that, that now that I'm getting a bit older, you know, that pain in the side or somewhere, and you go, ooh, that's been there for more than two days. Where's God taking this? Only old people understand that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, that's what we think. And to be 100% honest, I think that we make it far worse because we have the sufficient revelation of God in the complete Word of God that we so often neglect. I do know that on a personal level, every time I struggle with doubts like these, the one thing that takes it away is when I go to the Word of God and in prayer and beg God for wisdom. You know, modern worship songs, they can temporarily alleviate symptoms, but they do not take away the problem. The Word of God does take it away. <clears throat> and unfortunately, you know, there's no chapter in the Bible with the heading, you know, what's going to happen to the Telus family in, in the 2020s? Or your family. There's nothing like that. But instead, Scripture is filled. And I'm not even going to say this. Peter says it best. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 5. He says, His, the God's divine power has granted to us all things. Not some things. But all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? How? Through the knowledge of Him. 
who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he also gave us his precious and very great promises. Why? Why? So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Wow. So, for this very, very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and with virtue, knowledge. You see, we don't need the specifics of God's plan for our lives. All we need to know is the character and promises of our almighty God. Which we can often see by just looking at the cross. But they tell us our, fu our final future. They tell us about present loving sanctification. And for a man or woman of God, that ought to be enough. <clears throat> I mean, the Bible tells us that in this spiritual armor of God, do you remember what the, the sword is? The indispensable sword, do you remember? Lord of it's the Word of God. And you remember, almost the most important bit, you would think. <clears throat> Can you imagine in those days going into battle without a sword? And yet we do it and we try over and over and over again to do that as Christians. By the way, what is John doing here? He's doing exactly what we're saying. He doubts. Does he go to YouTube? Does he listen to Hill songs? Definitely not. He sends his disciples straight to Jesus Christ. And we too can send our hearts to Jesus in the word and in prayer. Our last one, worldly influence. Perhaps another reason that we doubt. And John perhaps doubts it. But could it be that John has accepted the Jewish leader's explanations on what scripture says in regard to the Messiah and what he would do at his coming. Remember that these guys were teaching that the Messiah would free Israel from the Roman occupation. The Messiah would eliminate all suffering, all disease, all affliction, all hunger, all pain. And while Jesus' miracles did achieve a lot of this in that area, it was by no means complete from a global perspective. And Jesus was re repeatedly refusing to be made king. He was doing nothing about the Roman occupation. Didn't even seem interested in it, to be honest. He was doing nothing to fix the corrupted religious system in Israel. <clears throat> now, the Jewish leaders taught that there would be many forerunners to the Messiah. Elijah, we get that from the book of Malachi. They said that Jeremiah was probably going to come as well. And that there might be even other prophets that would come back before the Messiah. Is it possible <clears throat> that even John began to believe that maybe Jesus was another forerunner, just like he was? Could he have got it all wrong? And by the way, I mean, this is like, quick, we can't take away credit from him here. This was deeply ingrained in society. Over and over again, the disciples would ask Jesus. Even after his death and resurrection, it was one of the first things they asked him. Acts 1.6, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're constantly waiting for this. And because of this deeply ingrained belief of the timings of the Messiah, they refused to accept proof of his deity that was before their very eyes because it did not fit in with their understanding of scripture. And today, to be honest, we hear of so many struggles, even in Christians' hearts, with questions. If God is a God of justice, why is there so much corruption in the world? And I'm talking about Christians struggling with these things, by the way. If God is so loving and merciful, why does he send people to hell? Why doesn't God just wipe out all false religions? And we have to be so very careful as Christians that as God works one miracle here and then he does not the next moment, as he allows one godless government to take over from another godless government. And the list goes on and on there as well, by the way. But we have to be so careful that we never doubt that he has and is working out his plan that will, without a shadow of a doubt, bring all of 
the book of Revelations, all prophetic scriptures, all in the fullness of His time to completion. You know, and one day when we know in full, I think we're all going to bow down and just say, Lord, you have acted in utter perfection. See, we just cannot let worldly influence, our own misconceived ideas, due to a lack of Bible study perhaps, demand that God acts in a certain way. Because instead, what should we do? We should trust in His optional instructions, right? No. No. We trust in His commands. His inerrant, perfect commands. We treat, if we treat, if we continue to treat, I should say, the Word of God as optional instructions for our lives, doubts, confusion, perplexity are going to plague us. And we will be tossed backwards and forwards in the wind and the storms. Instead, we cling to the Word of God. Guys, when we think about all of this, um, that, doesn't it resonate with so many of us? We doubt so much, and we're so grateful. We're so grateful that we read things like, you know, the Psalms, are, 30% of the Psalms are people asking the, the question, why, oh God? And we take, we take comfort in that fact, that he allows those types of questions, that he, <clears throat> he takes pity on these types of struggles. It's so encouraging now, as we see Jesus answer John. You know, was it a harsh rebuke? I mean, he had such a high calling, surely he's going to get in trouble for something like this. Right? No way. No way. Verse 4, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you have heard and see, what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those that have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is pre proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now you might be wondering where I'm going here, but the Gospel of Luke helps us with a little bit more information. <clears throat> John the Baptist, I want to read to you from, from Luke 7. John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Verse 21. In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And I added, then he answered them, go tell John what you see and hear. The blind see, blah, blah, blah. In other words, in love and care, God the Son doesn't say, yes, you should know better, off you go. He says, watch this. Watch this. Miracle after miracle after miracle. And then he says, go, tell John what I just did. For him especially. So that you can see. And you can bear witness to John. That the blind receive sight. The lame walk. The deaf hear. Why? Because John knows scripture. And he knows that the Messiah is doing exactly what he said he would do. Although the timings for world reign. Well leave that up to God. Now I wonder how John took this. I spent some time thinking about that. It's quite an emotional thought, to be honest. When his disciples got back to him and told them all this, I imagine he took the news with a lot of weeping. Thanking God for his kindness, confessing his doubt, and now able with renewed strength to wait on the Lord for his plan, his timing, as he sat in that awful dungeon. But John didn't have long to wait, did he? Before Herod's guards came and to John, dragged him out of that pit and threw the godliest man who has ever lived to the ground and cut off his head. Now, we don't have, I don't have theology to back this up, so please don't pull me over the coals for this one. But I think, I wonder, maybe it wasn't too long after that, that John, if God allowed, John would see from heaven. <clears throat> See God's plans come into fruition. As the God of the universe, right? The God of the universe humbles himself before evil men. Allows himself to be beaten beyond human recognition, Isaiah tells us. Allows himself to be murdered by being hung on a tree. 
crucified on a tree. All of that so that the Messiah can indeed begin his plan to destroy all evil, wipe away every tear, and wipe away every hurt. And if John saw that from heaven, Jesus dying in our place, paying for our sin so that we don't have to, so that the God of justice can give us a place in this new kingdom. And all of us as well. Wow, John must have said. Wow. Now I see the delay. Now I see the need for the dungeon. Just like we will one day see, wow, oh God. Even though the storms have been so rough, the pain never ending, life almost miserable. How could I ever have doubted you? One day we will scream that in praise alongside billions of other believers. Guys, if you are a Christian, you are not called into a secret club that has all the inside information. You are called to trust in his plan that you can only see in part. But I assure you, the only parts that we need to know is his integrity, his character, his power, his love, his honor, his truth, and so many more attributes mixed with his promises. That is all we need to know to live by faith. This morning, in my quiet time, I was reading from John 15, 9, and I'll just close with that and we can pray. But think about this. When you worry about if God loves you, if you worry about what God is doing in your life, where he's going to take you, think about this, John 15, 9, as the Father, this is Jesus speaking, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. Now stay in my love, he says. Man, God has got you. He's got you. No matter how difficult that mean that may be to accept right now, He's got you. Let's pray. Father, we bring our hearts before Your throne. Just, Lord, so aware of our weaknesses. We fear so much. We worry so much. And yet You have promised us over and over again. That you have gone to prepare a place for us. That we will be with you in utter perfection. That your plan is perfect. Oh God, how do we doubt you so much? Father, I pray that as this week carries on, you would give us strength. That although we can't see anything that's going to happen, even a few hours later, that we would just stand firm and be filled with joy. Because the joy is there to replace the fear that we don't need anymore. But we can only do this by your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, for you to work powerfully in this church this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, John. Just our music team, if they want to come on ahead on up. Um, have you any doubts today? Have you any doubts? Then you know where to go. And you go straight to Jesus. And we trust in his instructions. Which we are to obey, by the way, commands, instructions, um, which we have in the Bible. So we go to our Bibles. Um, John knew the scriptures, and he would have known as well about Psalm 146. Um, so let's just stand and sing Psalm 146 together.
church but just as a benediction we wanted to use this time to invigorate us so living room nurse put not your trust in princes in a son of man in whom there is no salvation blessed are we whose help is the God of Jacob whose hope is in the Lord our God amen and God bless you this week let's help to put the chairs away just as we close as well we'll see you over the living room